Well, I just love the, the joy of Christmas, don't you? And uh, I love, man, listen, I've loved Christmas since I was a kid. I think I love it even more today. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, my grandparents and my dad were gift givers. My, my dad was one of those kind of guys, is one of those kind of guys. He bought a present for you. Uh, he just couldn't hardly sit on it. You know, he just would get so excited about, about giving the present. That oftentimes, I'll be honest with you, at my house, we had Christmas early a lot of years because my dad just couldn't hardly stand having a present to give and not, and not giving it. And, uh, you know, I, and, and, and so I, I'm, I'm one of those I learned early age, had some great presents given to me. Uh, but, you know, I, as, as, as a dad with children of my own, I can tell you, at this point in my life, I, I love the giving of Christmas. Uh, you know, I don't have to get anything. I love giving and, and just the joy of Christmas and, and what that means for a child. But, you know, it means great joy uh, for adults. I, I love this story of, of, uh, of Jesus being born. And, you know, one of the interesting things about the Bible telling us the story of Jesus being born, have you ever noticed that there's two versions of it, right? You've got the book of Matthew that has the birth of Jesus in it. And today we read the story from the book of Luke. You know why that is? Do you realize that Jesus was born at a time and in a place where there was literally a clash of two major cultures? It was the clash of the culture of the Roman Empire on one hand and the clash of the culture of, of the Jewish and, and the people of God that God had raised up in Israel. And so you've got Matthew that's written primarily to a Jewish audience. And Matthew is written to try to help the Jewish people understand that when this baby was born, that when Jesus was born, he was born to be legally the king of the Jews. And so one of the interesting things about Matthew is, is that everything, when you understand that, the book of Matthew starts making a lot of sense because Matthew writes uh, about, uh, about the angel appearing to Joseph. And why is that? Because legally, Joseph is Jesus' legal father. And so the inheritance and all those things that happen legally pass through the father. And Joseph, uh, is it, the angel appears to Joseph in Matthew, and it recounts the, the genealogy of Joseph. You might just skip over those genealogies if you, if, you know, may not appreciate that that much. But that genealogy is saying that Jesus, because he's born legally the son of Joseph, that Joseph was the descendant of David through the line of the kings. It, every king of Israel is in the genealogy of Joseph. And so Joseph is, 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 is focused on because Jesus is legally the king of the Jews, is the son of Joseph. And it goes back to Abraham's is the start of the genealogy in the book of Matthew. You know why? Because Abraham is the father of who? The Jews. So that's the whole point of Abraham is that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Well, Luke's a little different. Luke is written to a, a Roman Gentile audience. It's written to the whole Roman Empire. And you know, in Matthew, the emphasis is on Jesus being the king of the Jews. But in Luke, the emphasis is on Jesus being the savior of the world. And because Jesus is the savior of the world, here's what it focuses on. It focuses on the, the, the appearance is to Mary. You know, that's where we get uh, uh, the angel appearing to Mary. And in, in the genealogy in Luke goes from Mary all the way back through uh, to David. Now, it's not the kingly line. It's another line of David because uh, jo Joseph is a descendant of David through the kings, but Mary is also a physical descendant of David through another line of David. And then, But it goes back further. It goes back to Abraham, but then Mary's genealogy uh, in Luke goes all the way back to Adam. You know why it goes back to Adam? Because Luke is trying to tell us that that baby, he is the king of the Jews, but listen, he's fulfilling all the promises and he's come to save all people, everybody. Everybody's a descendant of Adam. We're not all, no, nobody, you know, there may be some descendants of Abraham in this room. I'm not a descendant of Abraham by birth. But you know what? Luke tells me that all of us, if we are alive, if we're created today, that Jesus came to give us great joy. And one of the things I love about Luke, because Luke is trying to make sure that we understand that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that's one of the reasons that Luke spends so much time and pays so much attention oftentimes to people who would no normally be left out. If you ever notice that, that's a theme in the Gospel of Luke. There's, there's poor people that are saved. Lepers are, are saved oftentimes in Luke. Luke puts big spotlights 
on people who would normally be left out because he wants to make sure everybody knows that Jesus is for them. He's the Savior of the world. And one of the most beautiful ways that he does that is in the birth stories. You know, there's, not, there's just a few verses that I just read to the children that describe the birth of Jesus, and then there's a whole bunch of, of verses, way, almost twice as many verses describe the appearance of the angels to the shepherds as it does the birth of Jesus. And here's what's interesting about that. You know, today, if you uh, had a shepherd or you have a farmer or something like that, we don't think anything of that occupation. We think that's an honorable, you know, great way to make a living. And, and in, in, the, in the ancient world, shepherds were really kind of on the, on the lower uh, bottom parts of, the, of, of, of what you wanted to be when you grew up. And there's even advice in, in, in the Jewish Talmud that, 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 that was the oral law of, of the rabbis that, you know, discourage you from trying to let your son be a shepherd. Shepherds were a little bit on the out. You know, shepherds didn't have homes. Shepherds were out all night. Sometimes uh, the, the Talmud says that they'd fall into robbery and, you know, be, be a bunch of things. You were kind of a questionable character if you were a shepherd back in those days. And, and so, so the shepherds are included because, you know what, they're common people. They're not rich. They're not, you know, they're not uh, royalty or anything like that. They're common people. How many of you know God must love common people? Because He sure did make a lot of us, didn't He? He really did. And you know what I love about the Gospel of Luke is this angel comes. And you know, if, if you were God sending an angel and you were trying to establish your kingdom on earth, you know, I don't know about you, but I might have sent an angel to the Senate in Rome. You know, the Senate in Rome had all the power of the ancient world. Would, our, would the world have been much different if, if God had sent an angel to the Senate and said, this is my son being born. Y'all need to honor him. <laughs> I mean, you know. But you know what? God didn't do that. God didn't go to the people, to the rich people. God didn't go to the powerful people. God went to the shepherds, to the poor people. And he made sure that they knew that Jesus was being born, guess what? For them to have good news. For them to have great joy. For them to be included in the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but... You know, there's a lot of reasons I believe in Jesus. One reason I believe in Jesus is because I absolutely believe this book is true. I believe every word of it. I even believe the Bible when it says genuine leather on the cover. Amen? I really do. And, uh, and I believe it's true with all my heart. But you know, one reason, I, I, one reason I'm glad I believe in Jesus, because it's beautiful. Isn't it a beautiful thing that God would go to angels, He'd send His angels to shepherds and include them in the birth story of of Jesus, And notice what he says to him. I, I love this verse. I want to focus in this morning just a minute on this, on this verse. What, what the angel says to these shepherds. He says in chapter 2 verse 10, The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Now we, you know, like I was telling the kids a while ago, that anytime an angel appears to anybody in the Bible, that's the first thing they have to say. You know, if, you, if your idea of an angel has been, been uh, produced by Hollywood and, and you think that, you know, it's just like, I love one. It's a wonderful life. We'll watch it probably tomorrow night. But uh, but you know, an angel's not little Clarence running around, right? You know, an angel's not a Hallmark moment. He's not a little ornament you put on your tree, and they're all nice to make them out. Listen, when these angels appear to people in the Bible, it literally scares them to death. They are powerful beings. They are they are are, are the, the the power and might of God's messengers on earth. And when he when they appear, they have to say, "Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid." But aren't you glad today that angels are appearing? And telling people not to be afraid. You know what? How many of you know we live in a time of fear? We live in a time of great fear. All you got to do is watch the news. You know, I, I, I was thinking about this just the other day. How many of you know every week it's like a, a new existential threat to our very existence? I mean, you know, everything's falling apart, right? And everybody's worried. Every week something's about to get us. And it doesn't matter what news. I just challenge you. Go home this afternoon and, and turn on the news. And you can turn it on Fox News, you can turn it on CNN, MSNBC. It doesn't matter if it's liberal or, or conservative. It doesn't matter if it's Republican or Democrat. You know what? Everybody on the news all the time these days, if you turn on the news and you turn down the volume so you can't hear what they're saying, you don't have to know what they're saying. All you need to do is just turn down the volume and watch them. And you know what you'll see? A bunch of people that look like they're scared to death. Everybody's frantic. Everybody's afraid. But I want you to know at Christmas time, just like with those shepherds in the field, you know what? The message of Christmas is starts out with don't be afraid. 
Praise the living God. Don't be afraid. And notice what he says. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy. I love that. It's not just interesting news. It's good news. Good news and not just good news of, of okay things. Listen, it's good news of great joy. Do you have great joy in your life? Well, listen to me. If you know Jesus, you ought to. If you know Jesus, you can. Not just have a little joy. You can have great joy. Because the birth of Jesus, listen, is good news of great joy. Some people, you know, don't want to celebrate Christmas. Even some Christians, you know, a lot of times are like, well, you know, it's all, it's got pagan influence on stuff. Well, you know, whatever. But let me just tell you something. You ought to celebrate the birth of Jesus. I mean, I, you know, we're all in at my house. I mean, y'all, this might make some of you not think. Look, we, Santa Claus still comes. Y'all believe in Santa? Look at him. <laughs> you know what? Let me just tell you, man, celebrate. You know why Santa Claus gives gifts? He's Saint Nick. You know why he gives gifts? Because he's giving gifts to honor the Jesus. People that don't like Jesus don't like Santa, <laughs> you know. Now, I'm just saying celebrate. I mean, you don't have to do Santa Claus. I'm not saying you have to. I'm just saying don't be a Scrooge. Don't be a, a Grinch, right? This is a time of great joy. Jesus, this is good news of great joy. And notice what he says. I love this. And this is so Luke, which will be for all the people. How many of you are glad today that we've got good news of great joy for all the people? Everybody can be included in salvation. Anybody who believes. You know what? You might not have had anybody. You may be on the outs today. You may be you know, pushed off by your your family, your, your dad might not have anything to do with you. Your mom might not have anything to do with you. Your family may not want you around. Your friends may not have very many friends. You may not have, may not have a friend on earth. But listen to me. God wants you. This is good news of great joy for all the people. He wants you. He's seeking you. He desires you to know Him this morning. And so, I love that. Good news for great joy for all the people. And he goes even further. Why is it great joy? Well, if you don't have great joy this morning, my prayer is, is that God will take this next verse and open your heart to who Jesus really is. Because I just believe with all my heart, if you really understand who He is, it's hard to not have great joy. And so, notice what He says in verse 11. For today, this is the good news of great joy for all the people. Today, in the city of David... There has been born for you, now watch this, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I want to take just a minute and talk to you about why the good news is great joy because Jesus is the Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now all three of those terms, Savior and Christ and Lord, are used to describe Jesus throughout the Bible. If you go and you read your Old Testament very carefully, you'll notice that those three terms are throughout the Old Testament, building the expectation for Jesus to come. If you read your New Testament carefully, you'll notice that all three of those terms, Savior, Christ, and Lord, are used throughout the New Testament in the Gospels and in Acts and in the letters of Paul and Peter and John to talk about who Jesus is. It's throughout the whole Bible. But did you know that in, in Luke 2.11, this is the only verse in the whole Bible where all three of these titles are in the same verse. That Jesus is the Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let me tell you what it means that Jesus is the Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now first of all, that word Savior. Now, we, 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 we talked about how that, that in the, in, in Jesus, when Jesus was born, it was a class of culture. You're in the Roman world. The Roman Empire is the government of the whole world, including Israel. But the, the, the knowledge of Israel and the knowledge of God, the God of Israel and the knowledge of the Scriptures of Israel has pervaded the Roman world because the Old Testament was translated into Greek about 200 years before Jesus was born. 
And people all over the Roman Empire were hearing the stories and heard the stories of Moses and the predictions of the prophets and, and all, the, all the Bible. It was, it was becoming a known thing. And so there's a class of cultures. And here's the thing. Each one of these words meant something to a Roman ear, but it also meant something deeper to a Jewish ear who knew their Bibles. And so the word Savior, for instance, the Greek word for Savior is soter. You can spell that if you're taking notes, S-O-T-E-R, soter. That's the word for Savior. Well, you know, it meant something to the Roman world because Caesar Augustus, the guy that was, uh, was Caesar, he's the first Caesar of the Roman Empire. You realize Jesus was born at the start of the Roman Empire, right? And Caesar Augustus, who's the very first Caesar, his favorite term for himself was Savior. He, he, he didn't really like to call himself Lord. Now, later on, Caesars loved Lord, but, but not so much Caesar Augustus. And, and so if he signed something or if he had a coin that was made, you know how our, our, our money says in God we trust and has a picture of, of, of a president or whatever on it? Well, all the money in that day had a picture of Caesar Augustus, and most of it said Savior on it because he, he liked to be called Savior. And so he was the Savior, uh, and, and what the reason he liked to be called Savior is because he saved the world by bringing the Roman peace, the Roman Pax, Pax Romana, the, the peace of the world through his empire. Now here's the thing. The Jewish mind under, under, heard that, but they had a deeper understanding of Savior. Because in the Old Testament, even before Jesus came along, you know what God did? He raised up saviors, a bunch of them, not just Jesus, a bunch of them. Matter of fact, uh, the, the book that, 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 that uses the word Savior the most is the book of Judges. Y'all remember the book of Judges? And how that in Judges, God's people get into idolatry. They each turn to their own way, do what's right in their own eyes. And, and all of a sudden, they're taken captive and they're in bondage uh, to, uh, to, to, to a group of people that, because of their idolatry. And what does God do? He raises up a judge. He raises up people like Ehud and Gideon and Samson and all these different judges. Well, one of the, the, the ways the Bible refers to those men in Nehemiah and in Judges, some other places, is to call them saviors. They're soteres. They're saviors. Well, here's the thing. When Jesus comes along, you know what Israel needs? They need a savior. They want to be saved from the Pax Romana, <laughs> you know, because the Pax Romana's got them under its heel. They want to be saved from Caesar. But you know what Jesus has come to be? He's not come to be a political savior like Caesar Augustus, he's not become to be a political savior to just to liberate Israel from Rome. What he's come to do is to be the kind of savior that the angel told Joseph about. You remember what Joseph, the angel said to Joseph about the name of Jesus? Remember Matthew chapter 1 verse 21? Look at this. He says, this is the angel talking to Joseph. He said that Mary, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Yeshua, Jesus. You know what? Jesus' name means in Hebrew, it's Yeshua. It literally means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh saves. Yahweh is salvation. Jesus is the Savior because He's, he's the God who saves. But notice that His salvation is not just a temporary political salvation. It's not just the salvation of a Gideon or a Samson to throw off the Philistines or throw off the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, any one of those, uh, those termites that were bothering Israel. But look, you know what? He, he has come to do a much bigger work. He has come to save the people, look at this, from their sins. There's no politician that could do that. Gideon couldn't save one person from their sins. Caesar Augustus couldn't save one person from their sins. Only Jesus is the Savior who can save people from their sins. It's good news to all people because a Savior is being born. Well, notice he's not just a Savior, he's also Christ. This Savior is unique. What makes Jesus able to be a Savior? Why is Jesus a greater Savior than Caesar? Well, it's because he is Christos. He is the Christ. You know, a lot of times today, if you don't know your Bibles very well, or you don't understand that time, it would be reasonable to assume that Jesus' last name was Christ. You know, you might think that he, if Jesus signed a check, he would sign it, Jesus Christ. That's not the case. Christ is not Jesus' last name. If Jesus signed his name, or Jesus had a last name, the way it would have worked in, 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 in Israeli culture is that he would have been Yeshua, either Bar Yosef, 
because he's the son of Joseph. He's Yeshua bar Yosef. You ever notice that most of the time, though, he's Yeshua from Nazareth, right? They either identified you by where you're from or whose son you were. So he would either have gone by Yeshua from Nazareth, Yeshua bar Joseph, or because the greatest ancestor, the most prominent ancestor that he had, because he was the son of David, how's he referred to the most in the New Testament? If you've read the Gospels, you've seen it. He's Yeshua bar Son of David, son of David. And here's the thing. Christ is a title. What Christ means is, is it, Christ is, a, is, is from the Greek word Christos, which literally means anointed. It's from the Hebrew word Messiah, which is Messiah. We say Messiah. And so if you really want to understand how the word Christ works, every time in the Bible when you see Jesus and you see the word Christ, you can just replace that with Messiah. Might help, you know, we sing Jesus Messiah, right? But Messiah Jesus, Jesus the Messiah, Christ Jesus, Jesus the Christ. He's, he's Christ because He's fulfilling all the promises related to the Messiah that the Old Testament talks about. And you know what? They're primarily related to David. You remember how that God told David, He said, David, you're always going to have a son that's going to be on the throne of Israel. Now that promise has roots in creation because what did God tell Adam and Eve? He said, through the seed of the woman, I'm going to crush the hair of the serpent. And then later on he says, through the seed or the descendants of Abram, I'm going to bless, bless, bless the nations. And then later on he gets more specific and he says, David, you're going to have a descendant. Your seed, your descendant is going to always sit and rule on the throne of David. And so when Jesus was born, listen, all of Israel was expecting the Messiah all the, of Israel was expecting the Christ. And when Jesus came along, everything He did, everything that He said was in fulfillment of all the prophecies from His birth to His teaching to His life to even how He entered Jerusalem and everybody sang Hosanna and the fact that He rode a donkey. <laughs> Every bit of that was to say to Israel, this is the Messiah. This is the Christ. And so when, when, when the Bible says Jesus is the Christ or Jesus Christ, what you're saying is, I believe that Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, the son of Mary, is the Christ that, the, that God talked about in the Old Testament. That's what you're saying you believe. That's what it means. And so Jesus is the Christ. And, and notice that, that that's why all the emphasis in this story of Jesus' birth is about him being the son of David. He's born in the city of David, the place. He's born to the son of David through Joseph, the, the daughter of David through Mary and the people. And you know what? He's, they, he's done that way because he is there in fulfillment of the promise to David that there would be a king on the throne. That's who he is. That's why the angel tells Mary, you know, when, when the angel told Mary what, was, what the baby was going to be, you know, he focused on the fact that he's Christ, that he is the, the, the fulfillment of the promises to David. Notice what he says. This is what Gabriel said to Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. Again, every time he appears, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold... You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Angel told, uh, told uh, uh, Joseph and Mary, name him Jesus. I bet they didn't argue about that much. What do y'all think? And then look at what he says in verse 32. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. How many of you know that the kingdom of King David had an end? Solomon messed it up royally. Then Jeroboam after him really messed it up. And then the whole thing fell apart by the end of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when Jesus was born, there is no kingdom of David. Right? It's in shambles. How many of you know, though, that also the kingdom of Caesar ended? Every kingdom of man has been raised up and goes down. How many of you know that today we live in a time of great peril for the kingdom of America, right? Kingdoms fall, kingdoms come, kingdoms go. But listen to me. The kingdom of that baby that was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago will never, ever, ever end because He's the Christ. 
He fulfills all the promises. He's the only one that can fulfill all the promises. And there will never be an end to the reign of the Son of David, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. He's the Savior. He's the Christ. But you know what? He's the Lord. He's the Lord. You know, there, there, there's other saviors in the Old Testament, like I told you about. There's other Christoses. There's little Christ. You know, David's called Christ in the Old Testament. Some other folks are delivered. Some, there's anointed ones. that but Cyrus is called Christ. You know, Cyrus is called the anointed one in Isaiah. But you know what? Nobody else is ever called the Lord in the Old Testament. You know what makes Jesus Jesus? Because He is the Savior who is Christ. Now watch this. Not from the Lord, not of the Lord. He is Christ, the Lord. How many of you know that the Lord is talking about the God who talked to Moses in that burning bush? He's talking about the God who talked to Abraham. Jesus will later on tell a bunch of Pharisees, Israel, leaders of Israel, say, listen, before Abraham was born, I am. I am. I love that song that Brian, how many of y'all like to hear Brian uh, Hand sing, Mary, did you know? Man, I'm telling you what, boy can sing it, can he? Amen, that's right. And the last thing he says, what does he say? Did, Mary, did you know that you are looking in the face of the great I am? Jesus is not just a God. Listen, he is the God of creation. He is the God of the Old Testament who revealed himself to, the, to all those people who became a baby. Now, in Greek mind, you know, the word kurios, the Greek word for Lord, would have been used for anybody in, in power. If you had a boss or you had a master or you had a, a government official, they would have called them kurios. And especially Caesar was kurios. And later on, you know, Christians would be persecuted. And they would be made to say, Caesar esten kurios. Caesar is Lord. And you know what would got, got Christians killed? Because they wouldn't say it. What did they say? No, nah, nah. Jesus, Esten, Kyrios. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. So Romans understood what Lord meant, but listen to me. This claim that Jesus is Lord is a claim that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. You know who the first person to call Jesus Lord was? Who's the very first person that called Jesus Lord? Elizabeth. Think about it a minute. What happened? You remember Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist? Mary is pregnant with baby Jesus. Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. What does Elizabeth do? Mary walks in the house with baby Jesus literally in her womb. And Elizabeth turns and looks at her relative Mary and says, Why has the mother of my Lord come to visit me today? You know how she knew it? She said the minute that that baby and her mother walked in the room that John the Baptist in her womb leapt for joy because John the Baptist as a baby in his mother's womb recognized the presence of Jesus as a baby in his mother's womb because Jesus is the Lord. And Elizabeth said, my Lord has come here. And for a Jewish lady to talk about their Lord, they're not talking about a Roman official, they're talking about God. That's what that meant. Listen to me. We've got good news of great joy. Because in the city of David was born a Savior. The only Savior who can save us, me and you, from our sins. How many of you know our biggest problem is not political? It's really not. Our biggest problem is our sin. It's my sin, it's your sin. But a Savior has come who can save us from our sins. And He is Christ. The fulfillment of all the promises that God made through His Word. From the Garden of Eden to the promises to Abraham to the Kingdom of David. He is the Son of David who's sitting on the throne. And He is the Lord. He is God incarnate. He is God who became a man so that he could be the savior of the world and the king of the Jews forever and ever and ever. Do you have that great joy in your life this morning? You know, one of the things I love about Christmas time and I love about thinking about the birth of Jesus, Jesus didn't just come to be the savior of the world, he came to be my savior. 
He came to be your Savior. It's not enough just to believe in Je- that Jesus was born. It's not enough just to believe that Jesus was died. It's not even enough just to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You can believe all those things in your mind like they're facts, just like you believe George Washington is the first president or Abraham Lincoln was a president during the Civil War. But you know what? Until you believe and you receive Jesus as your Savior, Jesus as your Lord, Jesus as yours, you're not saved. This morning, if you've never received Christ, listen, receive this morning. What a great day to get saved. Christmas time. You could receive today the greatest gift that's ever been given. You could receive forgiveness for your sins. You could receive hope, not just for tomorrow, not just for next year, hope for all eternity. You could have your fear taken away. You don't have to be afraid of dying if you give your heart to Christ. You could receive hope and faith and joy. You could receive the love of a Heavenly Father. You can know for the rest of your life that you'll never be abandoned. You'll never be forsaken. That God will be with you. That your Father will love you and guide you and live in you. He Listen, Jesus came into this world so that He could come into your heart. Have you received Him as your Lord, as your Savior this morning? We want to give you an opportunity to do that. In just a minute, we're going to stand, we're going to sing. We're going to praise the Lord. And church, can I just encourage you this morning? Let's sing like we've got good news of great joy. Amen. You know, this might not have been that good a sermon, but I've told you some good news. And you've got great joy whether or not I did a good job of telling you about it or not. Amen? So let's sing to Jesus this morning and praise Him like He deserves to be praised. And if you're here this morning and you've never given your heart to Christ, and we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to stand. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. Listen, you come. You come. Tell, tell, tell me, say, I want to give my heart to Jesus, Pastor. We've got people who are trained, they'll listen to you, and they'll show you from God's Word how you can be saved, how you can know that you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's not hard. Any child can do it. You just have to call on the name of the Lord. Say to Jesus, Lord, I need to be saved. Lord, I'm a sinner. I I need your salvation. Would you come into my life? Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I believe you're the Christ. Come into my life. That's your heart this morning. You come right when we sing. Give your heart to Christ today. If you're here this morning, you'd like to be a part of our church family here at Enon Baptist Church. We'd love to have you be a part of that. Whatever your decision is, let's all stand together. Let me pray for us. Brother Ken will come and lead us as we worship the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you so much for the good news of great joy that in the city of David has been born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. God, thank you for all the ways that you made it so clear. If we just will listen, if we'll just read, if we'll just have ears to hear and eyes to see, Lord, you have communicated in such a beautiful way your plan, your purpose, and your salvation through Jesus Christ. God, thank you for that. Lord, I just pray that today, Lord, if there's anybody in this room who's not received the joy of your salvation, God, I pray that today they turn to you and be saved. Lord, I pray that you just bless us now as we worship you. Have your hand on this invitation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.